I think I met everybody on the way in. Um, for those of you who don't know me, which I think, or don't know Dwayne and I, I think that's everybody here. Um, I'm Robin Sarvis. This is Dwayne Tremel. We're the producers of the San Diego 48 Hour Film Project. And we're so excited to be here this morning for our first ever audio editing workshop with some fabulous audio editor, fabulous editors and also um, on location sound recorders and sound recordists so that we can learn more about how to make our 48 hour films even better how to standardize our films so that we can all have the best experience in theater, and hopefully we can all learn something new, because that's part of what 48 is all about, learning something new year to year. And, so, and the main thing is that I want to spend less time after the films are dropped off preparing them for the screenings. Right. <laughs> right. He wants to get a little bit of sleep between August 21st and September 6th. Yeah. So um, without further ado, we want to introduce you guys to the, the, the presenters of your workshop today, which are Christine Kirchmeyer, who is the editor for Four Lazy Guys, dot com, as Cassidy would say if he was here. Yes, Michael Tao, who is the editor for not only Amalgamated Grommets, but also Bad MF last year. And, and these two are also editors in their full-time real-life jobs as well. <laughs> we have Frank Forth who's an Emmy Award winner and a fantastic sound recordist. And he's done, I can't, I could stand here all day and talk about Frank and his accomplishments, but um, I'll let him talk about himself when he gets up here and also tell you more. And then Tim Bechtold, who's the sound recordist for, location sound recordist for fourlazyguys.com. <laughs> all right, so let's give Christine her microphone back and let's get this party started. Okay, we're ditching you and leaving you. All right. <laughs> Men to the back, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, to that, oh, okay. So, I'm gonna do it again, okay. So, <laughs> all right, I'll give you guys a little bit uh, more of a background on who I am, so you're not just like, who is this person that is young and a lady telling me how to edit audio? What does she know? So, I work at Cal State San Marcos. I've been there for about three years. I'm their in-house videographer, and I do. Um, a lot of the, the videos that just share the story of the university and communicate the message and engage with the community. And also, on the side, I am uh, edit for Four Lazy Guys, and we, I have done, this will be my fourth 48 hour, uh, my third one with Four Lazy Guys, and a little brag moment, every year that I've done it, our group has been recognized in some way, so I take that as a good sign that we're, we're doing something right. So. So today, talking to you about kind of just the real basics that we're all on the same page on how to get good audio, because audiences are not forgiving of bad audio. They'll forgive something that's out of focus, that the color, maybe it's not white balanced right, but if it's bad audio, they're just, they're not going to listen. So we'll talk about the why we're here on a Saturday morning talking about this, um, talk to you about what exactly sound is, because there's a lot of kind of weird language around it, so just start off by defining it, and then we'll go into the how, starting with how to even record clean audio. I'll touch on that very briefly because we have two location sound guys that are gonna go into that much farther. And then talking about the workflow once you actually get into Premiere. And then Michael Tao is gonna address the Final Cut editors. So let me just get a quick survey. Who's Premiere in here? Who am I talking to? Nice, and then Final Cut. So, oh, you guys are all concentrated back there. You must have like had a honing beacon, like, oh, Final Cut 10. I, mm. Feel you. Okay, so why? Dialogue is the sonic backbone of your piece that all of the levels, like music and sound effects, are in relation to. So if your audio, your dialogue levels aren't balanced, then the rest of your short is just gonna be, it's gonna be all off. And also, we don't want our ears to bleed. For those of you who have been to screenings in the past, there's always that one team that just recorded everything at zero dB and everything is just read the whole time. But we also want to be able to hear your story because that's why we're making these short films, is because we have stories that we want to tell, but if nobody can hear it in the theater, then no one's gonna care what it is. <laughs> so, now talking about what sound is, because sound is a really scary thing that I, it took me a while to dive in and actually start learning it. So I intimidated it by, for it by a long time. Sorry, the contrast is a little low on that. Um, it looks great on my computer, though. <laughs> um, so decibel, decibel is dealing with the loudness. So when we give you talk about decibels, and it's kind of, it's a little bit backwards if you're not totally familiar with the language. So zero dB, you think that'd be the lowest, but that's really like top of the range, and then it goes down from there. So then we go to negative dB. So it goes deals with less than zero, and then the other uh, phrase we'll be using is hertz, and that deals with your frequency and pitch. So talking about this is a low frequency all the way up to a high frequency. So that's hertz. And then decibels, that's dealing with your compression and your limiting. So those filters are gonna be adjusting the loudness. And compression, what that does is it controls the difference between the loudest louds and softest softs. So it's all about your dynamic 
range. And so for those, so we're all editors, and so we've all done some level of color correcting, yes? And so kind of understanding that um, your dynamic range when you're thinking about exposure. So if you have zero, it's black, 255, it's totally white. And that range, so if you think about it really meant to audio, you're compressing that range. You're bringing the zeros up and the 255s down, except the numbers are different if you're dealing in decibels. And then limiting related to compression in that it doesn't allow your decibels to go above a certain point that you set it at. So if you set your limiter at like negative 6 dB, which is what we're going to recommend, then anything, it's just going to put it like a wall and it's not going to let your decibels go over that and so you're not going to blow out our ears. And then when you're EQing, when you're using the equalizer, that's when you're dealing with the frequency and the pitch. And it adjusts the gain across different bands of frequency. So it also deals with decibels, but it also has a focus on frequency. So you can see that these two, they're related, they're cousins, but they're slightly different. They're different enough, they have just different enough functions, and we'll go through that. So just kind of a quick visual on sound because it exists in a 3D space. So if you think about it going through time, that's one axis, and then you think about the vertical axis, loudness, those are your decibels, and then you have this axis, which is your frequency, so going from low up to high. And um, because we're all visual people, I found just, I'll play some of it, a quick visualization of what sound looks like. So obviously we have it, we're going through time, and then the peaks, that's your decibel, your loudness, and then this is your frequency. So starting off low frequencies up to high, and if you listen to the music, that makes sense. So when that low kicks in, that's when the decibels at the low end kind of pick up. I won't make you watch all of it, even though I love this song. It's a good, right? It's a good song. Oh, too far back. All right, so that is just a quick rundown on what sound is, what this medium is that we are dealing with. All right, so now, how? What do we do with sound? So the first things first, um, starting off with recording clean audio, because if you don't start off with a good bass, then it doesn't matter how many filters you put on, how much you compress it, how much you fiddle with the EQ, it's still just gonna sound like poop. You can't polish a turd. You just can't. Something I tell my interns all the time, you cannot polish a turd. If you get crap, you're just gonna keep getting crap. You can't, filters can only do so much. So um, starting off, even when you, before thinking about any of the technical gear, the, what you're recording with, think through the edit. So, Think through the location, where you're choosing to tell your story, and can you control the sound there? So if you're outside, are you wanting to film right by a busy street? I don't know where your story is taking you, is that, but maybe that sound is part of your story. You have to make that decision. So you have to take into consideration the environment that you're shooting in and how important that diegetic sound is. And then if you're shooting interior, you have to pay attention to those sounds that our brains kind of turn out, those sounds that aren't essential to survival. So if we're all quiet right now, just listen. What do you hear? Yeah, the AC, but unless I said something about it, you would have just never even, like, wouldn't have even given that a second thought. And so that's why you always hear, you hear AC so much being recorded in shorts because you just tune it out. You don't think about the fact that microphones don't have selective hearing, something that Frank just said today. Microphones do not have selective hearing. They get everything. So um, be cognizant of that. You have the, if you have the power to turn off a fridge or the AC, you should do that, even though you're gonna be shooting this in the summer. Just kind of <laughs> something that comes, goes along with it. Um, Tim and I were just doing a short, uh, there you are doing a short a couple weeks ago. I'm sorry, I'm gonna embarrass you a little bit. And it was in this tiny, stuffy little apartment in North Park. So hot, and so Tim, he, and here's our sound guy, so you know, he has his whole, the whole get up, boom, and he just took his pants off. So he's just there in his boxers, just recording audio for us. That's the, the real, you know, behind the scenes, that's the glamorous part of filmmaking, is your sound guy in boxers. So you know you're serious. So yeah, so we turned off all of the fans and AC, and of course Tim had to suffer. And then even, um, and then the next kind of really basic thing, uh, Use an external microphone and an external recorder. At the very least, a microphone. So do not rely on your camera's built-in microphone. You will not get the audio that you want, I promise you. Um, and if you, an external recorder terrifies you, that's okay. I challenge you to get it anyway and kind of start fiddling around with it, getting used to it, um, so that you have that audio recorded separately from your 
video. It's just a better, it's a workflow that you have more control over, have more control over in post. And then, of course, monitor auto the audio the entire time. This is something that I see new filmmakers do often, is they will they'll set things up and then listen to it. They'll have someone talk for 10 seconds and be like, OK, levels are good, and then walk away from it and just record it for the whole duration. And then it's just it ends up being awful and because they, just, they weren't recording it the entire time. So have even if it has to be you as the editor, make sure somebody is on set with headphones the entire time those cameras are rolling so that the sound guy can be the bad guy and be like, oh, there's a plane overhead. Oh, heard dogs barking. Oh, said that right in the middle. So like that sound guy is, or the person with the headphones on is a really important person to the editor as far as sound is concerned. So don't be, so sound guys, do not be afraid to speak up. Even if you think people will hate you, in the end, it will be better. And then this you're going to hear a lot today. We're going to record at um, your dialogue at an average level of negative 20 dB. Um, if you're at all familiar with kind of a standard industry output, you'll kind of you'll know that that's much lower than. Hold on, there we go. That that's much lower than what we're going to output as. But we do that for a very specific reason. It's to give yourself headroom. So if you have an actor mic'd up and. Um, the scene calls for kind of the, a variation in their voice getting low, and there's this, this range and volume. You want to make sure that you have plenty of headroom because you don't want that audio to peak. Because once it peaks, once it clips, once it hits that red, it's, it's distorted. It's lost. You, there's no filter that's going to save it. It's kind of like when you're shooting and you have something that's completely overexposed, you can drop the exposure all you want uh, on it in color correction, but it's still just going to be this big white hole because there's just no information there. So it's the same thing with audio, when it hits that zero dB, it's going to distort, and you're just going to lose that information. So we want to stay very clear of that. That's why we record much lower. Now, getting into the actual editing workflow of Premiere. Oh, and let me start off by saying um, there's a lot of different ways to do these things that I'm telling you. This is just kind of the workflow that I've adapted because it makes sense in my process. But um, so what I want you to take away is more just the concepts of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And then as you kind of grow and start to learn more and play more with your in your software, uh, you can kind of adapt and change the workflow as needed. Because as you know, there's just seven different ways to get from point A to point B, whatever point A or point B is in Premiere or Final Cut. All right, so starting off with timeline structure. So this is, um, if you don't set your timeline up properly, you won't be able to apply effects properly. So it starts here. So just kind of real basic common sense for every different audio source, different scene, and different location, you just want a different track. And you might end up with like a dozen tracks at the end. That's totally fine. Um, totally normal in audio to just have a million tracks. So um, don't be afraid of adding tracks. And you want to do this. You want to put all of the sound that is going to have different effects applied to it on different tracks because you will be applying the effects at a track level. So if you think about your timeline and you have all of your different audio sources on different tracks, then when you apply an effect to a track, it's just going to go along that whole track. And you don't have to worry about tweaking like 17 different clips all the time and worrying about paste attributes working well or not. So applying effects, effects at a track level, and I promise we'll get into, I'll actually get into Marina and start showing you some of this in a bit. Um, so after you've reached the mythical land of picture lock, as Michael Tao describes it, it's like a unicorn. It doesn't really exist. We know that as editors. So we just pretend it does. Um, although after I put this together, I realized that during the 48, the workflow is a little different. Um, since you're edit if you're editing the picture and also doing the audio, you can kind of just do it simultaneously. That's a better, faster workflow for the confines of the 48. Um, so after. Your audio is on all the tracks. You can now you can apply your EQ and compression at that track level. So in Premiere, um, it doesn't. This isn't default up. This window isn't. So you have to open it. Window audio track mixer, and then how you edit. It's a little bit hidden as well. So let me just kind of play through. Um, so you have to toggle down when you're in that window. Toggle down your effects and sends, and then ID the track that you're applying the track the effect to. Open it up, and then. This example, I put multiband compressor right there because order matters in um, when you're applying effects. Premiere applies effects from the top down, so you want your compressor at the bottom to end with the compression because you you know you do all the EQ, you do the balancing, and then the compression just kind of puts it all in a nice little box. So compression at the bottom, and then if you want to edit the the effect, then you just double click on it. Pretty simple. All right. 
So Premiere, I love Premiere. Sometimes it's a little weird. Um, this functionality, it's looping and real-time adjustment. So this is more just kind of a, here's a little tip to help the, the workflow go a little bit faster, a little bit better for you when you're editing. So if you think about you, you're trying to isolate this frequency in this clip that you're editing, um, but you just want to keep looping that clip over and over again. So in Premiere, that functionality, it's kind of buried and hidden. Have to, I had to Google it to find it. Um, so here's my, the result of my Google search. So program window button editor, um, you're going to add um, in the broad bottom of your program window, there's that plus button, and then you're going to add um, the loop button. You're going to drag it into that window, and then you're going to set in and out points on that clip that you want to loop. Um, and then if you hit, hit space bar, it'll just keep playing over and over, over again until you tell it to stop, and then you can adjust on the fly. So you can hear it real time making adjustments um, on that clip that you selected. So the first thing that you want to do and actually comes to editing um, your dialogue and adding effects is equalizing it. And so if you remember, equalizing has to do with the frequency. So you want to isolate, you want to cut out the bad frequencies and raise up the good frequencies. That's basically, that is the concept of what we're doing with EQing. And so this is my process. I use high pass and low pass filters. So cutting off the low frequencies that are outside of the human vocal range. Um, and that are below it and above it. And so the general range is negative 60, or negative 60, um, 60 hertz to about 7,000 hertz is the general range of the human voice. Uh, of course, it varies wildly depending on who you are filming, um, varies between men and women. So it's up to you to kind of determine where your actor's uh, frequency range is. And then after I've cut off the ends, I will add an EQ, EQ filter to boost frequencies in the low to high mid ranges. So that's where all the meat of the human voice is. And so you'll be doing two things mostly, or two main things when you're doing the EQ. You're going to be warming the voice, and you're going to be improving your actor's diction, their enunciation. And so to warm a voice, the warmth of the voice lives in the vowels, so in those long words, and you can hear it, that's when your voice gets a little lower. And so this is just a general, general guideline starting point for where you adjust those values, where those ranges are. Um, and again, different for men and women, and again, your results will probably vary, but this just gives you that starting point. And then for improving diction, diction is in the consonants, so it's in the, those hard sounds, those like where you articulate. And again, just between men and women, just kind of a starting point for where you make those adjustments. And then the last thing that I'll do for EQing dialogue is I will do um, what's called notching. And in Premiere, they have a, um, a preset or they have a filter for notching, but in my opinion, it does not work as well as just doing the notching yourself by hand excuse me, <clears throat> in uh, Premiere. So I'm going to show you that. Hmm. So this, sorry, it's kind of a boring video that I brought. I didn't have a narrative at the ready to show you. So this is just a video that I made a couple months ago at work um, talking about one of our programs. I'll go to the next one. So I'm just going to loop this. We can't help students if we don't know who they are. And, and so this is the one where I've already applied my filters. Really help to identify um, students. And so I'll go down to the second EQ. To provide them and the you'll see that, I, that they need. this is where I put I a notch. That we can't help and so students if we don't what know I did who they are. Is I just and the Cougar Care Network has really helped to identify ticked on students one of the, um, as early as possible to provide the frequency points, them and then the I boosted the gain I believe so that I could hear bad frequencies. And I would I was sweeping it across, and so trying to isolate like where I was hearing those bad students, sounds, and you can kind of hear it. This is her essence that I was getting rid them, of. The support that they need. I believe that we can't help students if we don't know who they are, and the Cougar Care Network okay, has really helped to identify students as early as possible to provide them the support that they need. I so believe that we can't help partial, students so if we I don't know who they are, and the Cougar Care Network the has really helped to identify students as early as possible to provide them the support that they need. I believe that we can't help students if we don't know who they are. And then I will show you, I talked about them, but I didn't show them, so I'll go back to that. So for the high pass filter, sometimes um, on these filters, when you double click them, you're not going to get a pop-up window. Your, that will, oh, can't really see that better. Um, it's very tiny, I apologize. Um, 
but you adjust this style right here, and so I'll be listening to it, and then and I usually will close my eyes so I can just focus on the sound, and then I will adjust that dial until I hear her voice change, because I don't want to change her voice. I just want to cut out frequencies that aren't in her voice, so I'll be listening through it, and I'll just, I'll, you know, reach, I'll play with the edge of my boundaries and then kind of settle on something that I feel like sounds good. And I'll do the same thing for the low pass filter. Um, so it's all about just kind of playing, not being afraid. Um, Command Z or Control Z is your best friend. I use that all the time to the point where there's times in my like day to day life I would like I think Command Z. I'm like, oh wait, no, I'm not in front of the computer. I can't undo what I just did. Does anybody else do that? Anyway, <laughs> yes, you know. Um, and then. I'll show you the EQ, not from the notching. But you see how, um, see that curve? And so you can see those mid frequencies I raised just a little bit. And a little bit goes a long way. Um, like, there's not going to be a huge dramatic difference between your unedited audio and your edited audio, but it is going to make a difference. And it's one of those little details that just as you continue to grow, it's just something that you can incorporate to make your work just that much better. Um, and that makes all of us better in the San Diego film community. As Michael Tao put it, a rising tide lifts all ships, or boats, whatever rising tide lifts. What? Serpent. Serpent? Surfboard. Surfboard. Surfboard, there we go, because we're in San Diego. Surfboard. Like, is this a reference I don't get? I don't know. Nope, got it, surfboards. All right. And then again, you'll see that my compressor is at the bottom. And I'll get to compression in a sec. All right, so that is EQing dialogue. Oh, is it clanking? See? This is a good sound guy, because he was listening, and he heard that my necklace was <laughs> So he fixed it. Thank you. <laughs> that was planned. We reacted that out. Oh, he's not actually filming. He's just an actor, so we wanted to make you guys think that we were legitimate. So he's just, he doesn't actually know what he's doing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> OK. So then after you EQ your dialogue, then you'll go through and EQ your music. And this is just, it's a very quick one, and, it's kind of, um, and it makes sense what we're doing. So just add that one EQ filter. Um, and what you want to do is lower the frequencies in the low to high mid ranges to make a pocket for the dialogue. Because what you just did with the dialogue is raise those mid frequencies. And so to make that even clearer and even punchier, your music track underneath it gets a pocket like that. So there's this nice, warm, literal pocket for your dialogue. Um, and yes, a little bit goes a long way. So just lowering it by about three decibels within that range. Again, your results may vary, just a starting point. Um, and then after EQing is done uh, on your track, then you're going to do the compression and limiting. So in Premiere, uh, they have, I just use the multiband compressor, and it has limiting built into it. There's also, there's separate limiting filters, but I mean, why do more work? <laughs> just add one filter, um, and then adjust all of those parameters. And so compression, compressing audio across different frequency bands, and also has the limiter. And so a little tiny, but I'm just going to go through really quickly um, just kind of the language around compression so that you understand um, what like the threshold and ratio and output gain, what all of that means so that when you're in there adjusting, you're not just like making it up as you go, but so that you have kind of a, a base for what dials you're fiddling and what they're doing. So in the compressor, you have what is you, you have a, um, a parameter called threshold. And so really simple, what the threshold does, it, it sets that decibel level for when the compressor starts to kick in. So if you set your um, threshold at negative 10 decibels, then as soon as an audio level hits that, then compression is going to kick in. That's when you tell compression, OK, do your thing. So then how much compression is it going to give you? That's what your ratio is. So. If you think about as soon as it hits that, like say negative 10 decibel mark, totally random number, like it's not a number you use ever in <laughs> audio. Anyway, um, as soon as you hit that negative 10 decibel mark, um, and if it goes, if you have a three to one ratio, a signal that is three decibels over the threshold will be output as one decibel over the, over the threshold. So pretty straightforward with the ratio. And then another, um, some other things, uh, attack and release. 
Um, other than being a really good album by the Black Keys, this <laughs> determines, yes, I'm so glad you know, um, this determines how long it will take for the compression to kick in or to release. Again, pretty straightforward, you're just telling it how fast, telling the compression how fast it needs to move in and out. And then the final parameter that you can adjust with compression is your output gain. Because once you compress the audio, you're gonna lose some volume. And so um, the output gain makes up for that without going over your limits. And so it's just a way to safely raise to get that volume back up without peaking. Um, and then in the multiband compressor, so you can see here are all of your, your, frequent, your bands of frequency, and then down here are where you kind of adjust those decibels. And the Cougar Care Network has really helped to identify students as early as possible to provide them the support that they need. Okay, so I believe that we can't help students if we don't know pretty, who um, they are, good and the Cougar Care Network default setting um, is broadcast. I just, I set it and forget it. Uh, I don't really have to do much to it. If anything, it's a good just, because um, it just, what it does is lowers, um, I didn't explain totally what it does. But what it does is just, it lowers, um, it compresses your higher and uh, lower and higher frequencies and kind of just in boosts those mid ranges, because that's where all of, that's where all the juice is. Um, so I hardly ever adjust that. And then if you take nothing else away from today, um, then this, this is the biggest, this is really like the starting point of everything, why we put this all together, um, is setting a limiter, that brick wall limiter, and so that your volume does not blow out the speakers, blow out our ears. So what you wanna do is set that margin to negative six decibel. That's, um, that's our standard this year for the 48, so that we are all on the same page, I guess. Um, and so in here, in your multiband compressor, this little box right here, which you probably cannot see, it is the limiter box. Uh, it's very, very tiny, very simple. And you have your threshold, your margin, your attack, and your release. And so you just set your margin to negative six, even though for whatever reason, through the multiband compressor, no matter how many times I put in negative six, it'll be like, nope, I'm going to say it negative five. So, which is fine, um, it's close enough. So there's that, and then work has really helped to identify to make up for students that volume. as this early is the panel as possible where the to provide is. them the support so that they the need. Louder, I believe that we can't help students if we don't peaking. know who they are, and the Cougar Care Network has really and helped so to identify students as early as possible. Your dialogue or your volume is all about um, the averaging that they need. negative 12. I believe DB. that we can't help students if we don't know who they are, and all right. And then the final thing, oh, output gain, already talked about that. So that was the final thing. Dialogue averaging 12 dB. Um, I think that is all that I have for you. Uh, Michael Tao, if you have any questions, let me know. Any why questions? Why you a couple questions while I set my laptop. Oh, yeah, okay. So any questions? Christine, yes. I just yes. wanted to uh, let everybody know that I know that people take your Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Any other any any questions while we do this transition? Yes. What was your name? Okay, this could be dumb. Oh, sorry. What was your name? Oh, Pat. Pat, nice to meet you. Okay. Not a dumb question. I promise. You talked about in workflow. Mm-hmm. No, it is not necessary. You can um, many times, especially for the 48, we'll just have uh, like one boom mic for two actors. Um, and so if that's the case, then obviously you can't split that audio. And so then you'll just be compressing and, or doing your effects on that track. Um, but if you, for whatever reason you had, you have a sound guy and you have someone, you have the means to do different mics on different actors, then that's when you would split it. But if you don't, if you're not recording it that way, then. No. Mm -mm. Yep. 
And it's like, oh, yes. Do um, you use the programs that are come with Premiere Pro? Do yes. Do you ever go into Audition to do further? Not for the 48. Um, I, I do, uh, depending on how bad the audio is I'm working with at my job, I will go into Audition. But most of the times what I'm doing, I can just do right in Premiere. And especially for the 48, because you just, the, and especially the post-production, um, for anyone who's done a 48 before, you know the editors and all the post-production people are kind of, they kind of get screwed. Um, so as far as time, so um, you might not have the time to go into Audition. Okay. Yeah. But if you can, it's good. Yes. Um, you were talking about notching. Yes. And uh, which filter were you using? Because you threw out there mm, yes. high pass, okay. low pass yes. filter, compressor, a lot of terms. Yes, I did. Yes, I will. Okay, I will go back over that. That's a good question. So. Those are all of my favorite filters, just kind of good base filters to use. So the high pass filter, what that does is it only lets frequencies above a certain level pass. So the high frequencies pass above a level, and then low pass frequencies, it's the opposite of that. So it only lets frequencies that are lower than what you set pass through. So it's a little bit backwards, but low pass is at the top and high pass is at the bottom of the frequency range. Um, so that's what I start off with. And then I will go on to EQ, and that's... For, so the first EQ filter, I will, that's what I'll use to boost those mid-frequency ranges in the voice to warm the diction and to, or to warm the voice and improve the diction. And then if there are some bad frequencies in the room, which most likely there is, um, either from your AC or the fridge or maybe you're, the person who's speaking has those S's, like um, the woman that I was editing, um, where those S's are hitting just really hard and, and it's that, that kind of bad, like, oh, this, I want to get rid of that. And so um, that's when I'll use the second EQ filter to notch. And I will put that notch, I will set, and I didn't talk about this, um, there's a setting called Q in your parameters. And what Q does is adjust the width of that notch, so kind of that band of frequency that it's going to be notching out. And so I set that as narrow as possible, because I just want to isolate as the, a small um, band as possible to isolate that frequency. And then I will boost it so that I can hear that bad frequency and where it is as I'm sweeping my frequency across. Yes? How does that compare to the de -esser? De -esser, that, um, so that also does the same function. Um, just my own personal workflow, I just prefer doing it in the EQ. But that's also certainly another option. You can you're use de -esser. You're saying that Q point for the width of the band, yes. the sound of the S. Yes. Mm -hmm. It can be narrow, it can be wide, depending on a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. And then you're bringing the intensity down. Mm -hmm. and yes, and then I drop it. Three, four, five, this band. Actually, no, when you're notching, you can, like, you can be dramatic with notching and drop it way down because you want to get rid of that frequency. Unless that frequency is a really strong frequency in your speaker's voice, then you can't drop it down as far because you're going to lose that frequency in their voice. And then the quality of it will change. It'll but sound tinny or empty. You can listen to that as you're dragging it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's all about... Um, Ear fatigue is a thing, um, because when you start, you know, when you're doing all of this editing, everything starts to sound the same because you're just you're constantly comparing and trying new things and adjusting dials. And I am so glad that I do not have to do it all the time. So grateful for people like Tim. One final question. Yes. On the, the last point you made had to do with getting to a negative 12 average. Yes. Um, did I hear you right that you were adjusting the? Final output gain? Yes. Um, is it eyeball, or is there like a number that you can look for on negative 12 for an average? Um, I just eyeball it. So yeah, because it doesn't have to be perfect. You just kind of trust that intuition. You're seeing those levels go up and down. And just wherever 12 is, if it's in that general average range, then it's good. There's not a perfect sweet spot. So good questions. Thank you. Yes? People uh, might be tempted to uh, use noise reduction uh -huh. willy-nilly. Uh -huh. techniques that you are describing mm -hmm. are kind of superior ways to avoid it. So mm -hmm. I think uh, the group might benefit if they hear why you, why you wouldn't want to rely too heavily on automated noise reduction. Let's see. So think of something that I can compare it to. Well, like automated noise re reduction, it just, it, it in Audition, it works better um, than it does in Premiere, I think. Um, but in Premiere, uh, so what he's talking about, automated noise reduction, is that it will, what Premiere will do is that it will, you'll, you'll give it a certain spot on your audio track, and then it will listen for what it determines is the bad frequency, and then it'll, it'll drop those down for you. It does it automatically. It's, it's kind of like auto exposure. Like, 
eh, like, yeah, I can get you something, but it, it, unless you're like in there doing that manual exposure, like really adjusting it, then you're not going to get as good of a, a result. Set. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll swap it out. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.